We're back, we're back, we're back. Um, This is Insecure, Season 5, Episode 6, the final season. This episode is Tired, okay? Um, Which is probably how I look um, in my braids as well. Don't judge, don't judge. Um, So, we pick up from the last episode where Issa's at the hospital. Um, We're going to get Molly some coffee, I believe. And we begin with this dream sequence. Um, which I knew it was a dream sequence from the last episode, but um, Issa stops Condola and Lawrence when she sees him at the hospital with the baby and says, wait. And, um, you know, they talk about how we should make this weird. And Condola was like, and this is kind of when I knew it was a dream sequence. Condola offers Issa to hold the baby. And um, she don't even really trust her own baby's father to hold the baby so that's when i knew i was like okay this is a dream sequence and then you know <laughs> all of a sudden Issa tosses the baby and was like bleep them kids and uh then fought condola and then lawrence was like hey yo and lawrence was she was like yo you want some too and then you know we see Issa at her house and then she's um scrolling her instagram and she's looking at lawrence's instagram and sees that he moves back to la Left San Francisco, apparently, I guess, to be closer to the baby and to be more involved the way that Condola really wanted him to be. And um, Issa seems shocked. You know, she seems shocked and almost like she should have been in the know about it. But at the end of the day, that's not who you with. You with Nathan. This is also Natasha Rothwell's directorial debut. If you um, directorial directorial debut, if you don't know Natasha Rothwell, she's Kelly on Insecure. Um, she's the heart of Insecure to me. To me, she is the show. And I stand down on that consistently. It's my favorite character. And um, when I see Kelly, I, I feel seen on the screen. So there's that. Um, we Let's see here. Get into a scene with Issa and Nathan in the bedroom. And Issa seems like she's trying to uh, get something out of Nathan in the bedroom. Besides the obvious. Um, and it looks like she's looking for an I love you response. And um, it also looks like she's trying to get to, I guess, a place of feeling wanted because she's not with Lawrence. So I need to hear you say it because I can't have him say it because I can't be with him because he has a whole family now. So I need to hear you say it. I need to I need to know that I'm not alone in this situation. Um, But it doesn't happen, you know. Nathan and her end up laying there talking about a, a dude who has a coyote that he's walking like a dog in L.A. Uh, we cut to Nathan's job and um, it's at the barbershop because, of course, y'all know Nathan cuts hair. And the entire shop is having complaints about this dude, Suge, who is rude, who's late and he's authoritative, basically thinks that he runs the shop and does what he wants to do and does as he pleases. And Eric, I guess, is the owner of the shop. Eric Ark, whatever, however he says now. I know you spell it with an A. Either way, um, dude does not want to really get into it with Suge because Suge brings celebrity clients. Apparently, he had just brought James Harden in there. So at the end of the day, we don't really need to say too much because he brings in celebrity clientele. The rest of them are like, look, He's rude. He talk about bald headed women and they weaves. He eats my lunch. And his client was sitting there waiting and was like, yo, if I'm here any longer, my girl gonna think I'm cheating on her. So Nathan was like, you know, and the dude was like, yo, somebody got to hook me up, please. And Nathan was like, all right, I'll do it. I'll take the heat. You know, not trying to be competitive or throw sugar under the bus. But at the end of the day, dude, you're not here. You have money waiting at the shop. And, you know, he made sure the money stayed with the shop. Uh, Issa's at the hospital taking care of Molly's family, you know, making sure they all have food to eat, making sure they're all comfortable while they wait for Molly's mother to wake up. Still hasn't woken up. She's still stable, though, and she's still comfortable. She's still resting, but there have been no changes otherwise. And Molly's calling to check up, and Issa's like, yo, if you keep calling, I'm not going to be able to take care of your family the way that I need to. Leave us alone. We good. Um... <clears throat> Let's see. Koya and Issa go see Anthology Collective and um, Nothing But Water, their sponsor, wants to make them the face of the brand. But the leader shoots them down because basically the reputation supersedes them or represent, um, reputation precedes them, um, not supersedes them, but precedes them. 
and uh basically the whole crenshaw situation has given Issa a bad reputation the word has spread and buzz has gotten around and on the underground scene as an artist no matter what you're involved in no matter if it's graffiti no matter if, if it's music if it's film no matter what it is when you underground word travels fast because these people don't have time money or patience to be dealing with anybody who's not going to help them get in the right direction um they're looking for people who have not only the connection to get them to the bag but the ear and the eye and the passion and the understanding of what the vision is and if you don't have that then we don't need to work together so basically that's how it ends with Issa and this you know um meeting with a new potential client <clears throat> molly is at a retreat with um black partners of hers you know Torian and the two ladies that she works with and um they're sitting down with another dude that she went to college with and they're all playing first impressions and um molly ends up uh taking shots with them and taking drinks because it's all on the firm they're all being paid to be there you know so they're having a lot of fun on this retreat it's business and it's pleasure and molly ends up taking drinks and drinking 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 and wakes up in her bed a mess disheveled confused doesn't know what happened but she notices there's a watch there and doesn't know why this watch is there and she thinks that something happened again and she doesn't know with who so she meets the collective for breakfast creates a story about where she got the watch how she found the watch how the watch wasn't nowhere near her room how it was far far away from her room and um torian says that's his watch and then she's like yo what do we do and if we did do something, what was it? And he's like, we didn't do anything. Do you remember last night? And the rest of them are like, yo, you don't remember at all. You don't remember nothing. Well, cool, because we got the footage. Torian pulls out his phone and shows Molly acting a fool, a whole fool. I mean, a whole clown. Molly's twerking, Molly's shaking, Molly twitching. Molly is flipping, smacking it up, flipping it, and rubbing it down. Molly's doing everything she can do. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. What else happened after that? Oh, yeah, it was Molly time. That's what they basically kept saying, Molly. It was Molly time. Um, Issa goes to see Crenshaw with brownies because she wants to make up and apologize because basically that's the only way she's going to get up out of this. Um, not that she's being blackballed, but it is definitely hurting business because as easy as it was before and as, as great as the buzz was going, it's going in the opposite direction as far as her and new clientele. So she goes to apologize, but doesn't really own exactly what happened with her and Crenshaw, which basically was she didn't have his back and he still has a chip on his shoulder about it. And he's not exactly wrong. You know what I mean? He definitely is mad edgy with it and is like, you know, not letting it go. And he's definitely like a dog with a bone with it. But at the same time, Issa is definitely trying to water down the situation a little bit more than she should. It's like, yo, just own it. You were wrong. You didn't defend him. You helped him. But when the bag was about to be sacrificed or when it came to the bag potentially being jeopardized, she threw all that out the window, threw the passion and division out the window and was like, listen, you need to do it their way because my money's on the line. And that's exactly how he sees it. And he just lets her know at the end of the day, own your choices because now you need me and you want to work together again and you need me to stop trashing you so you can get your reputation back intact. But at the end of the day, that's not what this is. You need to apologize for what it really is and you weren't trying to be supportive of the vision when the money was on the line um back at the shop suge is late again when they're collecting rent and at the end of the day suge gets there and then um they ask for his rent money and suge responds sarcastically no nathan should pay my rent since he wants to take my clients and nathan doesn't take too well to suge accusing him of stealing clients because that's not what he was doing at the end of the day the client requested that somebody take him and you know, Nathan was available. And he was like, all right, I got you. <clears throat> the shop originally comes to Nathan's defense and they all start calling him out like, hey, yo, not only do you be late, but you're disrespectful. You eat people's food. You don't have any respect for anybody in the shop. You think that this is a you situation when it's an us situation. And Shook basically carries it like he don't have to answer to nobody because he brings celebrity clients in there. He was about to bring Wu-Tang in there, but forget it. I take him myself. Um, if it wasn't for me, this shop wouldn't be what it is. So he carries that type of, you know, air about himself. At the end of the day, this shop ain't nothing without me. <clears throat> um, 
So in the middle of the confrontation, you know, the conversation goes from a conversation to a confrontation. Eric tries to keep the peace, you know, let's not take it there, whatever, because he wants to keep the money coming in the shop because he's the owner. Um, and then he gets loud, he gets rude, and he gets very wrong and calls Nathan out for being bipolar. And if there's one thing that you don't do with somebody who has mental health issues, which I don't even know how anybody in the shop found out, maybe he told them, maybe somebody else did, but you don't throw it back in somebody's face when they've let you know that this is a situation that they're going through and it really didn't do anything to you in the first place. But that's what people do when they're problematic. They go below the belt when they get called out. Um, and everybody else kind of backs off after that. And it seems that Shook has been allowed to behave like this. He's been allowed to carry situations like this on. And when something like that is that toxic, that's not a situation that you need to be in in any situation, whether it be work, friends, roommates, whatever it is. If there's ever a situation like that, that's not a situation that anybody needs to be in. <clears throat> Molly's doing a presentation with Tori and back at the retreat. And um, she can't concentrate because her brother Curtis is continuing to text her. And Molly, of course, is thinking that it's about her mother. She's thinking it's either good news or bad news. And she gets thrown way off and way distracted because she's mad, you know, nervous with the phone and the messages coming through. And um, <clears throat> turns out her brother was only texting her about Chick-fil-A, a new one on Crenshaw. Um, she and Torian have a heart to heart over some drinks. And they talk about personal experiences, about how Torian's brother had cancer. Molly confesses that her mother had a stroke. And um, they basically come to the conclusion of, you know, work can't come before family and what's going on at home. And, you know, she just lets it be known. It feels really good to talk about it. And she always has to keep it together and try to be perfect. But it feels good to finally get it out. This is really the first time Molly has spoken about it with anybody besides Issa. And, um, <clears throat> you know, she really hasn't released and given it, you know, I guess a space to, uh, I don't know, I guess giving it a space off of her chest, you know what I mean? A space elsewhere besides inside, um, you know, just letting it finally have a life of its own and letting, you know, letting all this internal tension, you know, that's been building up finally, you know, I guess she finally exhaled. I guess that's the best way to put it. Uh, and, you know, they kind of... I guess begin to talk like they're on a date and begin to flirt a little bit. Um, but in reality, black women always have to wear a brave face, no matter what's going on at home. I watched my mother do it. I've watched my aunt do it. I believe my grandmother was probably even one as well to do it. Um, and they did it while raising children. Black women always have to wear a brave face. They're not allowed to wear their hearts on their sleeve. They're not allowed to cry. They're not allowed to be seen sweating when they have a million and one things going all around going wrong all around them at home or in their personal lives they have to let it be perfect they have to wear a brave face no matter what's going on no matter how many fires around them they got to put out they have to put them out and they have to do it with a smile on their face they have to do it with a brave face and they can't wear it to work or anywhere else they got to let it it can't be seen this is what black women have always had to do. We can't we can't see you doing that. It has to not be on your sleeve. It has to be hidden. It has to be tucked away. And honestly, it's not good. It's not good. It really will mess with your mental and physical health. Um, so getting back on track, um, Issa has another dream sequence about condolences and Lawrence. This time it's just Condola. Issa's getting food and she dreams that she sees Condola um and condola's like yeah thank you for giving up lawrence on that platter thank you for giving him up because he gave me a ring better than the one he gave you you know things have gotten bigger um he makes a billion dollars a month and then um condola fights back uh, um from the previous dream sequence and is like own your choices or whatever the case may be same thing crenshaw told her so clearly that's still in her brain too and lawrence and condola and the baby are living in her head rent free as well <clears throat> Um, Molly gets FaceTime from Curtis that her mother's awake and can go home as soon as tomorrow. She's not talking yet, but she's up. And, um, Torian comes to her room with a swag bag and they almost have like a little moment. And, um, her excitement, you know, almost gets, you know, her and Torian into a situation, you know, but, um, it didn't go there. Issa brings food home 
Um, and she and Nathan talk about their days. You know, how was your day? They talk about Molly's mom being away. Nathan says he might be done with the shop, their drama and the negativity and the lack of trust. And then he mentions leaving L.A. Um, Issa's face drops. He asks her how her day was. And, you know, um, previously she was like, you know, there's just work drama. So when he decides that he's going to bring up leaving L.A., Issa goes, oh, so that's what this is about. And she makes it about herself. She brings up the I love you and mentions that he didn't acknowledge it. And she says, you know, you didn't, you know, basically say it back. And he was like, yo, you always calling me out. You always, you know, trying to hold me accountable for something. But you didn't even think to ask me what I was going through. You jumped right to conclusions. You jumped to calling me out. You jumped to all these different things. But again, you didn't ask me nothing about what I was going through, how I was feeling. Um, And you say I'm avoiding something and you say I'm not trying to commit and you didn't even, again, you didn't ask what I was going through and you want to judge me and say all these different things. But in reality, it's you. You trying to project. You're the one that's all over the place. You're the one that's crying in my mouth, but then saying you want me, but then let's take things slow. But then you say you love me. And I feel Nathan on that. And I get it because at the end of the day, it's like if I say it back, what you going to come with next? You're going to come with, oh, wait, I'm not ready for that. You know what I'm saying? Issa is still wrapped up in his Lawrence situation and Nathan knows it. But, you know, he still wants to be with her because at the end of the day, Nathan clearly has a thing for Issa, has love for her, may even be in love with her. Because would you be with somebody that you don't love with all of this mess going on with them? I don't think so. <clears throat> um, So he lets her know she's inconsistent. And um, when she gets called out about it, she wants to drop it. And Nathan's fine with that. He just turns the TV on and continues drinking his wine and, you know, is eating because now you called out. So basically this episode, Issa's called out about accountability and owning her choices, you know, all around. And um, I don't know, I just felt it was a little bit selfish of Issa to feel like she needed an I love you back from him when you're all over the place. And he was dead right about it. And she was dead wrong. Clearly seeing that something was, you know, troubling him. And, you know, there's mental health issues there. So instead of trying to figure out, I'm not saying she had to babysit him, but at the same time, instead of trying to see what was really up, you made it about you. Um, and that was it. I don't see this playing out for Nathan's mental health well at all. Anyways, what y'all think of this episode? Was Issa wrong the way Nathan said? Um, or was Nathan in the wrong? What did you think of the barbershop scene, um, with Suge and was Nathan wrong or was Suge in the wrong? And, um, what did y'all think of Natasha Rothwell's dicto uh, dicto directorial debut? Um, I loved it. She can do no wrong to me. And um, we're six episodes into the season, so you guys know that we got like four left. So what do you guys think of the season so far? Um, what was your favorite episode thus far? What was your favorite moment of this episode? And um, who was also wrong or right in the Crenshaw situation? Um, or was Issa not wrong at all this episode? And um, what do you see, of course, coming with her and Lawrence? Because you know that saga ain't never really done. Anyways, y'all, thank you to the very small YouTube entourage that tunes in and that communicates. Um, don't forget to like, rate, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Share, tell a friend. I appreciate everything that comes from these reviews and these little conversations we get to have. And I'll be back next week with another one. Until then, y'all, I'm out of here.